Hello, and welcome to the first in a short series of videos about assembly language sound for the Coco. Many of you are probably familiar with the basic commands for playing sound, such as play and sound. They're fairly versatile. You can use them to generate tones in a wide range of pitches, and you can very quickly play a succession of short sounds to generate sound effects for games. But they do have some limitations. If you're playing music, you can only play one note at a time, no chords. Also, when you're using those commands, nothing else happens. It's just playing sound and all the rest of the action stops. And there's only one instrument you can play, and it's just tone. Using assembly language, we can try to work past those limitations and do something cooler. It is my ultimate goal to be able to play four note chords while other stuff is happening. Can we do it? I don't know. I think we can. We're going to try. In this video, we're going to introduce how sound is represented digitally. This applies not just to the Coco, but to pretty much any device that does digital sound. We'll also go over the hardware involved in the Coco that generates the sound. And finally, we'll get our feet wet and write some very simple assembly language code to generate some sound. As you will learn, the onboard sound chip on the Coco is one of the most advanced ever created, even by today's standards. It's the 6809. A little hardware humor. Very little. Sound is a wave. It is the propagation of perturbations of particles in a medium as they go from the source to the listener. In software, we represent that wave as a graph like this. If we just pay attention to the height of the wave, that is the amplitude. And the amplitude determines the loudness. So the taller it is, the louder it is. Now let's zoom in and take a look at the detail of this wave. It's a sine wave! Let's play it again and take a look at the amplitude as it goes across. So the amplitude gives us the loudness, but there's another aspect to the wave that's important, and that's the frequency. So in this example, the amplitude is roughly the same, not exactly, but it's certainly more alike than in this one. But let's zoom in and take a look at the frequency. If amplitude is the tallness, think of the frequency as the skinniness. How many cycles of the wave can you fit into a particular area of length? A cycle would start and end on the next wave at the same point. So a cycle might start here, come down, and go back up to here, and that would be one cycle. So how many cycles can we squeeze onto the screen? If we move to the left, we'll see the frequency does radically change. In fact, the frequency is very low in the beginning, and then it gets a little higher, and then a little higher, and then a little higher, getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. So the frequency is giving us the pitch. And in fact, the pitch in this case is going up by an octave each time. So it's the same note, but an octave higher. When you do that, you're doubling the frequency. So you're doubling the amount of cycles of that wave you can fit on the screen at any given time. With these two tools, we can make music.
Do you recognize that 80s sci-fi classic? Now let's add some bass to that. If you compare this with this, you'll see that the melody is a much higher frequency. You get many more of those waves squeezed into the same spot as you do this. So I've talked about the amplitude being the loudness and the frequency being the pitch, but there's another important quality to the wave, and that's just the shape. So in both of these lines, we're listening to sine waves. But there are many, many, many shapes of waves. Let's listen to this instrument playing the same notes. If we zoom in, we'll notice that a lot of things are the same, but something is radically different. The shape of the wave is no longer that smooth sine wave. It's something called a square wave. This does not look very square, but it is kind of square, and it's way more square than the sine wave. But all the other features are the same. The amplitude as it goes across, the frequency as it goes across, those are all the same. The difference is simply the shape. So we've got amplitude giving us the volume, we've got frequency giving us the pitch, and now we have the shape of the wave giving us the quality of the sound, also known as the timbre. And of course, there are many shapes other than just sine wave and square wave. Any sound you have ever heard can be represented as some kind of shape of a wave. What can the Coco do? We're going to tell the Coco to play some notes, and we're going to record it into the software to look at the wave. So for the play command in BASIC, we're starting with an O1, so the very first note is going to be very low pitch, that's octave one. So we'll play a C, then we'll pause for a quarter note, then we'll go up to octave two, and we'll play a C, and then we'll pause. And then we'll do further octaves getting higher and higher and higher until we're done. So let's listen to what we've got. And let's take a look at what we've got. So how do these waveforms differ? Let's zoom into the first one, the lowest one. This is about the best sine wave, I guess, that my Coco could make. I'm pretty sure it's trying to make a sine wave. I could be wrong. Maybe it's not actually trying to make a sine wave. Sure doesn't look like a sine wave. But that's the low. And if I moved forward, I'm not going to zoom in anymore. Let's look at the next one. The next one, the frequency is a little higher. You can see more waveforms per unit distance. And here they're scrunched together even more, looking a little bit more like a sine wave. A little bit higher, a little bit higher, and I think that's the highest one. If I zoom in a little bit more, it actually is looking a little bit more like a sine wave, a pretty approximate one, but there you go. The Coco generates sound by using this digital to analog converter, or DAC. It receives a six bit number one, two, three, four, five, six and it converts that into analog voltages, which end up going out to your TV or out to the cassette jack. There's also yet another way to generate sound using one bit, which goes out to the TV as well. In fact, you can use these in conjunction, like you could use these to do some music and this to do sound effects at the same time. But what on earth do I mean when I say six bits to a digital to analog converter Six bits of what? What is that? What number is that? What is that number for? If you look back at the wave, I've been kind of vague about what it really is. It has an x-axis and a y-axis, and maybe you've deduced that the x-axis is simply time. So as time moves forward, this brings us to the part of the wave that we're playing. 
But what exactly is that y-axis? All I've said is the taller the wave, the louder it is, the more frequent the wave occurs, the higher the pitch is, the shape of the wave determines the quality of the sound. But what exactly do each of these values mean, each of these y values as you move across? They represent the changing voltage levels that would be sent to, say, drive a speaker to move that speaker in specific rhythms, specific vibrations to reproduce the sound that the sound wave was representing. The DAC takes each of those bits that you feed it, and each bit position represents a voltage level, and you just add up the voltages for all the bits that are one. And that's how you can get a range of voltages that change over time that would then be sent to the speaker. But the point is the Y value is a number, and that's the number that these six bits will spell out and send to the DAC. The X axis is represented by real time, so the number that's sent to the DAC continually changes with time. And so at a particular point in time, you'll have a particular value here, and that represents this value on the Y axis as we move across the wave. So as you're probably beginning to see, BASIC is doing a lot of heavy lifting for us. It's basically assembling a wave and sending it to the DAC in real time on the fly in response to your sound and your play command. And now that we're doing stuff directly in assembly language, we're going to have to do that ourselves. In the next exciting installment of this groundbreaking series, the way we control this is with the PO1, the peripheral interface adapter number one, there are two signals that come out of it, a CB2 and a CA2. And there you have it, nine lines of code that do nothing but get us ready to do something. Boop, 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 into slot zero and it's stuck. Play the high half of the square wave, then play the low half of the square wave. That says that whatever bit three is set to will be the value of the signal. Why? Boop, 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 all the way out the TV. So we're going to have a very low, low, low pitch sound and another low pitch sound. I don't understand. I don't get it. Is there a bug in my code? Someone help me. And you will be flabbergasted at the incredible power of the onboard sound chip in the Coco that is far more advanced than any other soundboard onboard sound chip you've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.